how firm, how firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his excellent word. What more can he say than to you he hath said, to you who forever gives to Jesus have led. supply the flame shall not burn the I only design my trust to consume and my goal to refine what hope what hope that we have in our Savior's blood proclaimed in the truth of his excellent word he will he will bring to fulfillment every single one of his promises that we have in his word and one of those promises is this very sentiment that we get out of the heidelberg catechism um, that's going to be an explanation into this new song that we're going to introduce to you called christ our hope in life and death and in the heidelberg catechism it asks this fundamental question really it's the question of like life in general and that is this what is your only comfort or you could even put in there hope. 
What is your only comfort in life and in death? And here's the answer, that I am not my own, but belong body and soul in life and in death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood, and he has set me free from the tyranny of the devil. He also watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all things, all things must work together for my salvation. Because I belong to him, Christ by his Holy Spirit assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. And that is just a really wordy way of saying we are not our own. We were bought with a price by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. If you are in here this morning and you are in Christ, know this, you are owned by him. You are in union with him. His blood covers you. There is therefore now no condemnation for you because of that. And so we're going to do something this morning as an act of worship, something that we don't typically do. But I'm going to, I'm going to read just that question again. And I want us to respond with just those two lines So I'm going to read it to you, and then I want us to respond together as an act of worship, and then we're going to sing this song. So church, what is your only comfort in life and in death? That I am not my own, but the long body and soul in life and death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So we're going to teach you the chorus of this song, and then we're going to sing it together. Sing hallelujah, our hope springs eternal. Oh, sing hallelujah, now and ever we confess Christ our hope in life and death. And let's sing that again. Oh, sing. Oh, sing hallelujah. our hope in life and death. Amen. So what is our hope? That is our hope in life and death Christ alone Christ alone what is our only confidence that our souls to him belong who holds our days within his hand what comes apart from his command and what will keep us to the end, the love of Christ in which we stand. Oh, sing, oh, sing, hallelujah, our hope springs eternal. Oh, sing, hallelujah, now and ever we confess. Christ our hope in life and death. What truth can calm, truth can calm the troubled soul. God is good, the God is good. Where is His grace and goodness known? In our great Redeemer's blood Who holds our faith When fears arise Who stands above The stormy trial Who sends the waves That bring us night Unto the shore 
assurance that we that we've received god thank you for the mercy and the grace of yourself and be glorified we pray in your name amen amen you guys can have a seat well again we just want to welcome you this morning if you are watching online we are so glad that you are tuning in with us um, if you happen to be in here and new Man, we are so glad you are here and just welcome you with the love of Christ. We would love to get to know you and connect with you. And so we have some connect cards on the back of your bulletin. You can fill those out and drop them off in one of the offering boxes on the back wall. Um, you can also stop by the welcome table and introduce yourself. Uh, if you want to find out more about who we are and, and ministries and just the church in general, you can go to our website, satisfiedinjesus.org, and we just love to meet you and love to connect with you. So we have quite a few announcements this morning, so buckle up. I'm going to try to move through them pretty quickly. Um, first of all, our picnics on the patio that we've been having um, during the summer, the last one is going to be uh, this coming Sunday, the 26th. And if you are unfamiliar with what that is, those 
Those are just times of fellowship and food together that we do after third service over here on the patio on the, the, at the um, picnic tables out there. And so the last one of the season will be this coming uh, September the 26th. So it's not too late. If you've never been to one and want to just fellowship and get to know people, we just encourage you to do that. Um, next, the TED Trip Parenting Seminar. You are in good luck. If you happen to procrastinate, uh, it actually paid off this time. We are extending our registration for adults um, that is through next Sunday as well. So if you got to this morning and realized, oh man, they're cutting off the, the, the TED Trip Seminar. No, we're not. You can register all the way up until next Sunday and then it will be cut off. That said... If you did procrastinate and you have kids, it didn't pay off because the child care is full. So if you still want to register, you'll have to find some child care for yourself because it is full, but we would love to have you. Um, and you can hop onto our website, uh, onto our events page, and sign up for that until next Sunday. Um, also, our Faith Young Adults Welcome Back Night is tonight uh, from 6.30 to 9. Dinner will be provided. We're going to be introducing our new study through the book of Hebrews. I am really looking forward to that, seeing the preeminence of Christ in all things. That book is incredible. And so if you are in here between the ages of 18 to 25 and you've never been to one of those, you can hop onto our website, go to our events page. You can find out all the details there, or you can come up and talk to myself after the service. We'd love to meet you and talk to you about that. So that is tonight, 6.30 to 9. And lastly, it is Communion Sunday, which means on Communion Sunday, we do our benevolent offering uh, for those in our body that have specific financial needs. So any cash um, or checks designated to benevolent placed in the offering boxes will go uh, to that benevolent fund as a, as a way um, to meet those needs. And so I believe that is all of the announcements for this morning. So I'm going to pray for our children, um, and then we can greet one another. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we love you, and we thank you, Lord, just for the privilege it is to be the church, Lord, the privilege it is to be called sons and daughters of you, the living God. Lord, I pray that that would take deep root in our hearts, even right now, even this morning, Lord, as we have come to worship you. Lord, we pray for our kids as they go off to children's ministry, Lord, that you would open their hearts to see the glories of Christ through your word, Lord, that they would be changed and, and, and Lord, saved from a young age, Lord, and then walk in newness of life with you. Lord, pray for their teachers as well, that they would just be empowered by your spirit to communicate your word and your gospel to their hearts. So, Lord, we commit them to you now, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, kiddos, you are dismissed to Sunday school. The rest of you greet one another with the love of Jesus. All right, we're going to continue with our time of singing, so let's stand together. This morning as it is Communion Sunday, this next hymn that we're going to sing will take us right to the foot of the cross, right to the finished work of Jesus. So we just encourage you as we sing it to respond with open heart. Repent of sin if you have to. Pray and ask God for mercy if you have to. But worship him and behold his glory in the gospel.
and be seated. This morning we have the privilege of hearing from one of the members in our church. He trains pastors globally around the world. He's going to give us an update this morning um, on some of the pastors that, that he supports and that we join with him in supporting um, in Afghanistan. And he's going to bring the word to us this morning. So let's uh, invite him up, Tim Carnes. His story, at the story of Jonah. So if you would please turn with me there to the book of Jonah. Now, I I know this is one of the most well-known stories in the Bible. um, And so sometimes it can be difficult to preach something that is so familiar to everyone. But when we think about Jonah, right, what's one word that comes to your mind? The fish. Yeah, of course, right? The fish gets all the press from this story, all the children's storybooks. But if you think about it, only three verses out of the 48 in the whole book actually talk about the miracle of the fish. For you see, the book of Jonah was more about Jonah, it was, was not uh, only about Jonah, but it was actually about something else. It's not just about the fish, but something far deeper. And so before we dive into the purpose of this story, I just want to Test your knowledge a little bit. See, what do you remember from the book of Jonah, right? How does it begin? God gives Jonah a command. Go to Nineveh. Proclaim judgment. Their wickedness has risen up against me. And Jonah says, yeah, right away. I got my bags packed. I'm ready to go. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity. You're shaking your heads. No, that's he actually did quite the opposite, didn't he? In fact, he went the opposite direction. He not only said no 
Instead of going northeast into Nineveh, he went southwest to Joppa, got in a boat, headed to the far east to the end of the earth, far west to the end of the earth. Well, what did God do? Well, okay, I guess we'll have to find somebody else in. Jonah's not going to work out for this particular. No, right? He brings a great storm upon the ship. The sailors are terrified. There's this whole exchange where they tell Jonah, call upon your gods. And, you know, God was the last person Jonah wanted to talk to at that point. And so the, the storm is caused uh, coming up. Jonah confesses that he's running away from Yahweh. They throw him overboard into the Mediterranean Sea as he's sinking to the bottom of the sea. Then we get the story of, or the event of the fish, right? Was that it? Was that the end of the story? Well, no, God causes the fish to literally vomit Joseph, uh, Jonah up onto the beach. And then God asks a second time, okay, are you ready now? <laughs> Jonah goes. Goes to Nineveh, proclaims 40 days the city will be destroyed. And then what happened? <laughs> they believed. These pagan Assyrians uh, who committed horrible acts of atrocity, even worse than what we're seeing today, they believe, they put their trust in God, they show the fruits of repentance by uh, putting on sackcloth. The king gets up, he tells the whole city, we need to, this is, uh, we're in trouble here, we need to turn to the living God. And they did. In fact, it was, I think, it's the greatest revival in recorded human history where an entire city repents. I mean, Billy Graham never saw a whole city come to Christ. And then... That would be a nice way to end the story, right? God shows mercy upon the Ninevites. Because of their repentance, he does not bring the calamity in which he had promised. It's an amazing story. A story of a disobedience and, and redemption, so to speak. A story of second chances. A story of God's power over nature. It's a wonderful book. And it could have ended right there at the, chapter th at the end of chapter 3. And it, it was happily ever after. But notice it doesn't, right? There's a chapter 4. Now, if you weren't familiar with the story, try to put yourself back to maybe the first time you heard or read it. There should be a nagging question when we reach the end of chapter 3. What might that question be? Why would Jonah blatantly rebel against God and refuse to go? There was another prophet in the Old Testament, I, th I think around 1 Kings 13, tells us his story. He disobeyed God, and God sent a lion to devour him. So Jonah was taking a pretty high risk. <laughs> Why would he not only rebel against God and say no, but actually run in the opposite direction and get out of Israel? It's a key question of the story. You'd think, given his hatred for these Assyrians, he would have jumped at the chance. Right? Yes, God, I'm there. You want me to preach judgment? Oh, yeah, I'm going. But he didn't. Why? Was he worried about persecution that he would face while he was there? Was he concerned about the obvious rejection that he would face as well, knowing what he knew about these Assyrians? Was he concerned maybe just with, you know, why would I go that far? It's like 600 miles. They're not going to listen. Why do that whole journey? Or was he just done being a prophet? Well, it was a big enough issue, again, that he took some significant risks to rebel against God and run the other way. And this is why we have chapter 4. It answers the question. Look with me at verse 1, if you will, chapter 4 of Jonah. After the end of chapter 3, it says, God relented of the disaster. It says, but it, that's speaking of God showing mercy to the Ninevites, it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my own country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O Yahweh, please take my life from me. It is better for me to die than to live. And we see a couple of things here. One, Jonah's pretty mad. He's mad at God for showing mercy. And secondly, we learn here that there was a conversation between Jonah and the Lord at the very beginning. But it's a conversation the author chose not to reveal to us until now. You see, when God told Jonah to go to Nineveh at the very beginning, Jonah, what did he say to God at that time? I'm not going because I know what's going to happen. 
I know that you are a loving and gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and great in loving kindness. I know you're going to show these people mercy. And that's the last thing I want. You see, Jonah did not want to give these Ninevites a second chance because he wanted them to burn in hell. A prophet of God had such great hatred. And it is in Jonah's complaint that we see the theme of this wonderful story. As God deals with Jonah, we see that really the purpose of this book is to put on display God's compassion. This story isn't really about Jonah. He's not the main character. The story is about God. We see his compassion in several ways here. First, we see his compassion upon the sailors. Think back with me to chapter 1, that storm that came. I want to ask you a question. Was that storm for Jonah or for the sailors? You see, if, if Jonah, if God was trying to give Jonah consequences for his rebellion, he had 60 miles of journeying to Joppa to do that. He could have brought snakes, robbers, another lion. And then Jonah gets on the ship, and God waits till they go out into the water, and then he brings the storm. Upon that ship. And again, if you read through chapter 1, we see the sailors, their concern, and then, then their awe, right? When they see God calm the sea after they throw Jonah overboard. And how do they respond? It says in verse 16 of chapter 1 that they feared Yahweh. And they offered to him vows, made vows and sacrifices to him. In that statement there and in their response, we see these sailors. They weren't just adding God to their pantheon of gods. They recognized he was the one true God. And so it says they feared Yahweh greatly. That was an expression of they came to repentance. I mean, chapter 1, if you look at it, most of the verses, a majority of the verses, are dedicated to the sailors in that chapter. I think they are the focus And in some ways, God led Jonah to them so that Jonah would lead them to him, even though he didn't intend to. And God's compassion wasn't just limited to those sailors, right? Of course, we have in chapter 3, he shows compassion and mercy to another group of pagan Gentiles, the Ninevites. As they put their trust in him, as they repent, it says that God relented concerning the disaster he was going to bring. And it says there in chapter 3, verse 5, they trusted in Yahweh. I believe, again, he led them, God did, to himself. God could have let them go on in their wicked ways, right? God could have let them justly be judged for their sin and their violence and their atrocities. And yet, he takes this prophet from Israel to come and get their attention. And look at verse 10 of chapter 3. It says, When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster he said he would do to them. And God's compassion didn't stop there with the Ninevites. There's someone else in this story he shows compassion to, right? Who's that? Jonah. First time, right? When Jonah's sinking to the bottom of the Mediterranean and God brings a fish to rescue him. Not to punish him, but to rescue him. If God wanted to punish Jonah at that moment, he would have brought a great white shark rather than a fish. And it's so ironic. Jonah was unwilling to show mercy to the Assyrians, and yet God showed mercy to Jonah. And while he was sinking to the bottom of the sea, it says in Jonah 2, verse 2, that he, I, Jonah says, I cried out and you heard me. Jonah experienced God's compassion, and God saved him from drowning using the most unique life vest in human history. Didn't smell so great, but it saved him nonetheless. And in this story, we see God show Jonah compassion not once, but twice. The second time's in chapter 4. Look with me at verse 4. The Lord said, do you do well? Do you have a right to be angry? Jonah went out of the city, sat to the east of the city. Notice Jonah didn't even answer him. He made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade till he should see what would become of the city. Now the Lord God appointed a plant, made it come up over Jonah, that it might be a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant so that it withered. 
When the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind. The sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And he asked that he might die and said, It is better for me to live, to die, than to live. So picture the situation, right? Jonah's out there in the heat. This is in modern day Iraq near Mosul. It can get up to 130 degrees there. He's got no shade. So it says there in the text that God provides this plant, right? And it seems that God is again showing compassion on Jonah here by delivering him from the heat. In fact, notice it says in verse 6 that he grew, God grew up over Jonah, a plant to be a shade over his head. But was that all that was going on here? There's a second purpose statement given in verse 6. Notice it says there that he grew over, up over Jonah, the plant to be a shade over his head, and to save him from his discomfort. Now, that seems like an odd expression, to save him, to deliver him from his discomfort. Notice, those of you with an ESV Bible, you might have a footnote there next to that word discomfort. If you do, the footnote probably says something like this, evil. That word discomfort can be translated as evil. I want to come back to that in a minute. So here we have the, the scene, right? Jonah is so angry, he wants to die. Verse 4, God says, do you have a right to be angry? Jonah ignores the question, and he continues on, and he goes out of the city and sits on the hill to the east. And I think this is probably how it happened, because again, in Jonah chapter 3, it says Nineveh was a three days journey. Jonah only stayed there one day. I think he came in from the west gate, proclaimed his message, 40 days and Nineveh be destroyed for the day. Then he leaves the east gate, goes up onto the hill and sits there. Now why? Why didn't he just go back? Okay, God, I did what you told me to do. Why does he sit there? What is he waiting for, you think? Yeah, I think you know, right? This guy's heart hadn't changed. I think he's sitting there waiting. Well, maybe these guys will go back to their wicked ways, and then God will torch them. <laughs> An incredibly racist and vengeful heart. In fact, back in Jonah 4, verse 1, Notice there that phrase, it says it, it displeased Jonah greatly. Actually, we, we should translate that more literally. The Hebrew there has, it was evil to Jonah, a great evil. What was evil? God's mercy. God's showing mercy, Jonah thought, was an evil. <laughs> in fact, that word evil is a key word in this whole story of Jonah. It's a Hebrew word, ra'ah. Follow me carefully here. Back in Jonah chapter 1, verse 2, God tells Jonah the wickedness, the ra'ah of the Ninevites had reached him. And so he sent Jonah. Then in verse 7, the sailors say this. Let us cast lots so that we may learn on whose account this calamity, this ra'ah has happened. Ra'ah can be used as the evil someone commits or, or an evil or a bad situation that happens to someone. And so they said, let us learn on whose account this ra'ah has come. And they repeat it again in verse 8. And then in Jonah 3, verse 8, it says there, the king tells the people, let each person turn from his ra'ah. And then in verse 10, it says that God relented from the ra'ah, the calamity he was about to bring upon the Ninevites. And then in verse 1, Jonah sees God's action as ra'ah, a great ra'ah. And then comes verse 6. Don't miss this. God brings a plant as shade over Jonah's head to save him from his ra'ah. You see, the great evil in this book was not just the Ninevites, but Jonah himself. And God brought that plant in order to help Jonah see that. In order to help him see that. And to see this isn't how it should be. God then brings a worm or some grub or weevil, we don't know exactly, some creature that causes that plant to wither within a day. As fast as it grew, it went away. And then God brings a scorching east wind. So Jonah's out there hot, no shelter, no shade, no comfort, and he says, I want to die. And then God again asks him, do you have a right to be angry? Jonah, I guess, needs these questions repeated in his life, doesn't he? And this time Jonah answers, I have good reason to be angry. I miss my plant. <laughs> now he cares about something. Right? He didn't want to go to Nineveh but because he, he didn't care if the Ninevites died in judgment. And then on the boat, he didn't want to pray to God. He didn't care if the sailors perished or not. 
And then he refused to want God to save the Ninevites. Yet this same prophet got upset to the point he wanted to die because of a plant and what it did for him. And here's where we come to the whole point of the story. The whole story has intentionally led us to verse 10 and God's response. Look with me there. And the Lord said, You had pity on the plant for which you have not labored, nor made it grow, which came up a night and perished in a night. Should I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their left and much livestock. And then it ends. Boom, done. No verse 12. Wait, wait a minute. What did Jonah do? Uh, how did he respond? Did, did he listen that time? Did he repent? Did he go back in the city? What, what happened? Well, you see, the purpose of this book is really to show us this. That question was ultimately not aimed at Jonah. It was aimed at you and me. It was aimed to the reader. We aren't given Jonah's response because that's not the point here. The point is the Lord bringing us to this place to ask ourselves the question. God's saying, I have compassion for lost souls. How about you? Even the Ninevites. You know, as we read this story of Jonah, we can get caught up in bashing this prophet. And he probably deserves it a little bit, right? We can get caught up in just how evil, how wicked, how racist, how self-righteous, how vengeful this guy is. And all the while, not hold up a mirror. Because look, when you or me, when you or I treat someone else with contempt because they're not like us, we're like Jonah. When I turn a blind eye to the many needs around me, I'm like Jonah. When I cease to or lack praying for the lost, I'm like Jonah. When I don't show care or concern for others around me, when I fail to tell the gospel when given opportunities, I'm like Jonah. When I don't care about the souls of others, souls here, the souls abroad, I'm like Jonah. When I wish judgment on others, and let me be real here, Taliban, ISIS, Muslims, Buddhists, atheists, Let's make it more real. When I wish judgment upon those who are of a different political persuasion, those who are of a different skin color, different background, different nationality, brothers and sisters, when we do that, we are Jonah. When I don't care whether another person goes to heaven or hell, I'm just like Jonah. God called Israel to be a light to the nations, right? In the same way he has called us to be a light to those around us. The great Baptist preacher Charles Purgeon said this, If sinners be damned, at least let them leap to hell over our dead bodies. If they perish, let them perish with our arms wrapped about their knees, imploring them to stay. If hell must be filled, let it be filled in the teeth of our exertions. Let no one... Go unwarned and unprayed for. That's God's heart on full display in this story of Jonah. And an even brighter light was shown on his compassion as his son hung on a cross. Listen, those Ninevites deserve judgment. Those sailors deserve judgment. Jonah deserves judgment. But you and I deserve it too. God showed mercy. He showed compassion. And in the same way, he says, I have compassion on lost souls. How about you? Let's pray. Oh, Lord, we thank you for this wonderful story that is so jolting, really, at the end as we are forced to turn our attention to our own hearts. And Lord, truly 
look there to see do we have any contempt or anger or bitterness, even maybe hatred towards another to the point where we would not even bring them the gospel. Or maybe it's indifference. Father, you show us by your own example your great compassion. You who are the one that has been offended and sinned against. Oh Lord, give us that same heart. As we look to the cross, as we look to your mercy for us, may you or give us that same heart of mercy towards others. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. We're going to turn our attention to taking communion together now. And as we do that, certainly the greatest act of compassion seen in human history was the Son of God on that cross. He didn't have to do that, right? But he's a heart full of compassion. And again, he had compassion on the Ninevites, he had compassion on the sailors, and he's had compassion on us. In fact, do you know how wide, how, how expansive God's mercy is? It extends from the end of one hand to the other, doesn't it? And so as we come to the table now, I, I just want to appeal to you. Have you truly put your trust on, in this compassionate God? I mean, these, these elements, we have a little piece of bread and, and some juice. Those mean something. This is not just some ceremony that Christians do. This actually has significance because it points us to the very act of love and compassion, the only act of love and compassion that can actually bring us eternal life, can bring us into a relationship with this merciful God. And so I would appeal to you, if you have not yet put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, recognized you, like all of us, are a sinner in need of a Savior, and that He's provided a way of forgiveness because He cares, then please, don't worry about the juice and the bread right now. Give attention to seeking God's forgiveness, and He will freely offer it, just like those Ninevites. And all the atrocities they committed, when they repented and put their trust in him, God showed mercy. And so now as we sing this song together to express our gratitude for that mercy, make sure uh, there's some uh, little cups in the back you can get. But I want to just have us take a moment silently before the Lord. Those of you who have put your trust in him, just take this time now to give him thanks and ask him to help you to show that same compassion. If you don't know the Lord or you're not sure, take this time now to talk to him about that. Seek his forgiveness. I cannot comprehend the agonies of Calvary. Were you the perfect Holy One, crushed your son, who drank the bitter cup reserved for your blood? Has washed away my sin, Jesus. Thank you. The Father's wrath completely satisfied, Jesus. Thank you. Want your enemy now seated at your table, Jesus.
Apostle Paul tells us this in 1 Corinthians 11. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's remember him together. Oh Lord Jesus, we do thank you that we were once your enemy. And now... We are your friend, and more than that, you've given us eternal life. More than that, you've given us a fellowship with you in a unity, Lord, that's beyond our comprehension. And so we are so grateful. We thank you. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together and respond.
Self, we cannot die. Our souls were purchased by your blood, and we are now hid in union, God, with your son Jesus because of his perfect work on the cross. Lord, we thank you for that. We praise you for that. We give you glory for that. Lord, we pray that, that those realities, that those truths would sink in so deeply, Lord, that it causes us to love and treasure you more than we love or treasure anything else that this world has to offer. Lord, and that in doing that, we would find ourselves loving one another. Lord, the way that you do. God, do that work in our hearts, we pray. Build our faith, build our affection, and may it all be to the glory of your name. We love you and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, if you need prayer this morning or would like to just talk with someone or maybe you have questions about the gospel or something you heard, man, please, as, as Tim said, don't hesitate. Like, come and speak with someone. Come and pray with someone. Let them minister the gospel of Jesus Christ to you. That's what they're here for. So they're up here to my left, your right, and we just love to meet and talk and pray with you. And I'm going to leave you with this benediction from Romans 15, 5 through 6. And it says, may the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony 
such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, amen. You guys are dismissed.